So if there's one object I could observe in the night sky, it would have to be the planet Jupiter. There is so much detail to see in our telescopes. But there's one huge problem we need to overcome if we want to capture high resolution views of Jupiter or indeed any planets, and that's being able to cut through the turbulence of the Earth's atmosphere. So what we're going to do in this video is we're going to turn this blurry imagery I captured with my telescope, we're going to turn that into a high resolution view of Jupiter. Now, if you haven't seen the video where we captured the imagery of Jupiter, then you need to watch this video. And the principle is that to beat the scene, we're going to use a high speed camera in the telescope. We're going to capture tens of frames a second, hundreds of frames a second. We're then going to use auto stack it. It will sort through those uh, frames. It will detect all of the ones that have been blurred by the atmosphere. We'll then keep the sharp ones. We'll stack those together and we can then sharpen that in Registax and bring out all those hidden details. It's all there in the data, it's just that we need the software tools to bring it out. Now, I am absolutely buzzing as I record this. I gave a talk last night to one of the local astronomy societies about observing and imaging the planets. I was then back in good time. I caught a view of Mars just before it started to cloud over. And then this morning in the, in the post, I picked up my copy of Astronomy Now and I've got a picture that I took of the Milky Way rising at the winter star party so i'm absolutely buzzing today what a way to start the weekend so before we get started going then we've got to download three bits of freeware the first is fire capture the second is auto stack it and that's what we're going to use to sort through the video frames reject those that are blurred by the atmosphere and stack the sharp ones and then we're going to use registax to then apply the sharpening and what i'm going to do now is switch over to the laptop and then we're going to start doing our processing so let's just remind ourselves of open up fire capture. So if you remember then when we were setting up fire capture, we did two things in the settings. So scroll down here to settings, open that up. And then we have selected use universal time. So you don't have to worry about daylight saving time for different time zones around the world. And we're using the win Jupos file naming. So make sure if you use fire capture, definitely do those two updates. Right, so let's go to the images I shot the other night. So they are in my new images folder. So these are the Jupiter images I shot on the night. And you can see because I saved them in the WinDupos format, they've got this convention here, 2022, 9th, which is September 17th at 23.16 universal time. And that's at ninth of a minute. I've also put the lights, the white light filter in. I wasn't using a color filter and I've recorded in SER files. So let's go and open them up. So there they are, we've got the great red spot just disappearing there. And you can see the effect there of the Earth's atmosphere. We've got the sort of shimmering coming in. And occasionally we just get to see some details there. Not very clear, but there are there occasionally. So if you remember then earlier, we downloaded auto stack it. So the first thing we're going to do then is open up auto stack it. We'll go to the video file. Right. So here is our SCR capture. I've opened up this one 0017. So the one I took on the 18th of September 2022 at 0017.3 tenths of a minute. And you can see that this is the first frame. So there's nothing particularly remarkable about it. It's just that was the first frame we recorded. And in the two minutes we captured Jupiter, any more than two minutes and Jupiter's own rotation will blur the imagery. We recorded 11,249 frames. So if you remember when we were shooting in a fire capture, we recorded without any of the color data. All the color data was there, but we de press the debayer button and we were recording in black and white but with the color detail still in the data. So what we must do when we go in here is click on color. I leave mine on auto detect or you can leave it on grayscale if you were say shooting the moon or you can look up what your color for your camera is what the color formatting is and then choose it from there. So either I just leave it on auto detect it records it in the data and then and then that automatically converts back into all the color that you naturally had. So I have set it to planet. It's not a surface, we want a planet. We've got this dark area around the outside. We can see the limb of the planet all the way around. Uh, definitely do not want drizzle. I obviously did some Mars imagery as well. So let's leave that up there. 
and I am going to leave my noise robustness out five and that's the normal setting. So what auto stacker is going to do is going to look for fine details in the imagery. Now because our exposures are by their nature quite short, they're only 10 milliseconds, we've got this sort of very peppery, grainy sort of uh, appearance and that's just the natural noise in the image. So Autostacker has to look through this and has to work out what's the noise, what is noise and what is fine detail. So if we set the noise robustness at about five, that's the middle of the range. What I'm going to do is then press analyze so you can see there we've finished our sorting through auto stack it's finished sorting through and that is our sharpest frame so that's much better than the uh, first frame we had in the original so auto stacker has finished sorting through the frames it's now put them in sharpness order so we are now at frame number 3166 that's the best frame we recorded still it's very noisy peppery appearance but there's the most details in there just see the great red spot disappearing off the limb and there is io so what we can do is use this little slider here we can go from the sharpest frames the highest quality through to the worst frame so that's 3,166, and if we go all the way through, you can see the frames gradually get worse and worse and worse till our very last frame, which really you can just see there's almost two stripes. There's none of that fine detail we saw back on the first frame. So we know our noise robustness then is right. It's sorted them into the right order. And if you have a different noise level to what I've shown here, you can then either increase that or decrease that. So it's worth checking before you stack all those video frames. So you can see there, yeah, that's much better. So the next thing to do then is to place alignment points. So what Autostack is going to do is going to break the image down into lots of little squares. It's going to look for the sharpest details in each one and then recombine them back together. So we've got our alignment points on this second window here. So I've selected 48, that's just one of the defaults there. And I'm going to press place APs in the grid and it breaks it all down into that detail grid. Now the problem with doing this is that when AutoStack it comes to recombine all those little squares, it sometimes looks like crazy paving. So we're next going to click is multi-scale. and it puts bigger squares over the top of this. So we've got big squares and little squares all jumbled together. Now the problem is that's 520 alignment points times 11,000 frames. The software, the computer's gonna melt before it finishes that. So let's increase that to 80, which is what I normally use. And you can see there are little squares and big squares on top of each other. And using those big squares averages out and reduces that chance of the mosaic ink hatching pattern appearing in the background. So always use multi-scale. And we've got 176 alignment points. That's probably quite a lot, but I'm gonna press stack anyway. Right, so the next thing to do then is to look at how many frames we want to stack. So this here is a quality graph. The gray line is the order that the frames were captured in. You see you've got good bits, and then you've got bad bits as the scene comes and goes. And then Autostack has sorted them all into this graph here. And then you've got this green line that then shows. We had quite a few very sharp ones, not enough, of course. Uh, by 50% of the frames, the quality was down to about, I don't know, what's that, a third? So I just generally look around here, and I know with my settings, about 1,000 to 2,000 frames tends to be a good enough stack to then bring out the sharp details. Of course, the more frames you stack, the better your signal to noise ratio is. Conversely, you have few, you have more blurrier frames, ergo you have less fine detail. So it's a bit of a balancing act between trying to improve your signal to noise ratio and trying to only keep the very sharpest frames. So looking at here, that's what uh, about 1,000 to 2,000. That's just where we're starting to this curve to round off. So about a thousand frames looks about right. And again, if you move around here this shows you if i move the blue slider around you can see that bar graph moving along so somewhere about there looks to me where it just starts leveling out somewhere around there that's only 500 frames but the good thing is that auto stacker will let you stack 
different numbers. I prefer to stack with hard numbers. So I'm going to get 500 and let's leave it 1000 and 2000 and I leave the percentages. Some people do 10%, 20%, 25%, whatever. I just use numbers just because that's what I'm used to doing. You can choose whichever you prefer. I leave it as a TIFF, then I'm not worrying about uh, compression. That's 16 bits, there's loads of detail in there, loads of layers. And we're going to hit stack. So what Auto Stacker is now doing, it's now breaking this imagery down into all those little squares, looking for the sharpest details in each one and then recombining it. And if you remember, we had what was it, 176 alignment points across 11,000 frames. So there's some serious arithmetic on this. When I finished observing and I come back in at, in the small hours, I'll set this all up and I'll then go to bed so that I can then come down in the morning and this is all processed overnight. Uh, so I will leave that running. I'm going to go and get a cup of tea and I will see you in just a second. So we've finished stacking now our video of Jupiter. We've got 500, 1000 and 2000 frames. So if I go back to Windows Explorer and Autostata naturally puts them in the into folders. So we've got 500, 1000 and 2000 frames, auto stack up frames. So we'll go to the sharpest one, which is auto stack up 500. So this has fewer frames, but they are all sharper. So I'm expecting to see more fine detail, but more noise. Let's wait for that to open. And this is a 16 bit tip. So loads of detail. So that's not looking too bad. Let's go straight to the worst case then. So 2000 frames. Let's compare the two. So again, we've got now got less noise. It's hard to tell them apart actually. Let's put them both on the screen at the same time. So you've got 500 frames on the left and 2000 frames on the right. So I can just see here there's more sort of fine detail. It's slightly smooth. It's all quite subjective. It's all right down in the fine details level. But you can see here we've got a smoother image. And on this side we've got a slightly more detailed image but more noise. So what we'll do then is we are going to open up Registax and then apply our sharpening. Right, so before we get running with Autostacker, there's two things I set up when I installed mine years ago. First thing to do is go to Settings, Processing Area, and set it to 2048. Registax is quite an old program, and when it first came out, computers just simply didn't have the processing power that they have today. So it's to only process the very center of the image. Uh, but modern computers can easily cope with it now. So 2048 pixels, that's the area that Registax will process when you change your, when you adjust the set, when you blah, 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 when you apply the sharpening. So let's open up our picture. Our captures 500. So this is the screen that Registax applies, and this is in the wavelet sharpening. So what it has, it has all these sliders down the side. You can move these left and right and add more and more st stronger sharpening. Uh, there's also then a denoise, de denoise column down here. And of course, as you sharpen it, you also sharpen the noise that's inherent in the image. So you can then apply some blurring and that smooths out the noise details. So I have a very simple approach to applying sharpening. I clicked use linked wavelets. And the first one is quite coarse, the second one's a bit finer, third, medium, fourth, and then the sixth one down here applies very fine detail. And using the linked wavelets automatically cascades that all the way down. And I simply move this all the way across to the right. Wait for that to process. And it has a think. And you can sort of see here all this detail has appeared. But what's happened is that because we've also processed the noise it looks like one of those old black and white newspaper photographs with lots of little dots in there so we're going to have to apply a little bit of noise denoising to that let's average that out with 0.2 and you can see there that smooth the background now i actually have this saved as a default you can load schemes and save schemes so i'm going to load my jupiter linked wavelets jupiter linked wavelets 
so I've applied 0.2 of the sharpening and I put 0.5 on as the denoise and look at all that fine detail and there's your moon as well as appeared great red spot right on the limb but all this stuff it wasn't really visible when we were looking at the video file but it's quite clearly there hidden in the data now the other thing I like to do as well is click RGB balance and I click auto balance and it gives it that more natural colory look so that still looks a little bit noisy to me so what we can do is then just bump that up a click or two so that looks a little bit better maybe one more just for luck and you can see there maybe one too much let's get down one let's go back down to 0.55 so it really is a balancing app between picking the number of frames the the noise in the image and trying to get the sharp details we're trying to balance this sort of three-way triangle but I don't think that looks too bad. So when we compare this now, the sharp stack, that stack has all been sharpened. That's absolutely fantastic compared to that original imagery. Absolutely blows me away every time. And we'll just save that. So what I often do is click a new folder and I call that Inked Wavelets. And then save in there. So I've kept my original stack if I ever want to come back to them later on. And then I've got my, what I've then sharpened up with my linked wavelets. So if we open up the 2000, let's just compare the two. So that was our best 500 frames, loads of fine detail, but a little bit noisy. And because I've set it to automatically process it should appear straight away as a processed image as i think do, 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 do. there it is so if i auto balance that color again so that's not looking too bad actually so if we save the image let's go up here let's put it in the same place things wavelets i'm going to put a suffix on the back of this 2000 frames let's compare the two side by side so we've got 500 frames on the left and 2000 frames on the right so you can see around here these little dark stripes that just that little bit sharper all the details in the atmospheric belt just that little bit sharper in the 500 frames it's not much it's not not a great deal of difference but all that little stuff there you look at these little bits these little protrusions coming off here just that little bit clearer in the 500 frames and that's just because you've got 500 frames that are stacked and this is what i love about this i'm not down in the tropics i'm not down in the canaries or down in the caribbean where the planets are overhead this is shots between gaps in the jet stream from a northern european or relatively northern european location and yet by using that lucky imaging despite our poor seeing we can still pull out this wonderful fine detail so what I'll do then, let's minimize all this, doink, 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 and we'll open up Photoshop. And we'll just do a little bit of last minute tweakery. So open up the 500 frame one, because that was the sharpest detail. And we'll just do some last minute tweakery, just to make it really pop. So there's a lot of detail in there. I'm just gonna make it that little bit sharper. So first thing I do is I duplicate the layer. That means if I ever make a mistake or want to go back, I've still got my original data there. So well, what we'll do then is we will image adjustments exposure, just make it a little bit brighter. If you've recorded it already brighter, then you don't have to worry about this for me. Right, uh, but it made everything brighter. So I want to increase the contrast. So I'm going to get the curves up. This is either Control M image adjustments curves so you can either press ctrl m or do it like that and that gives you the histogram of what the data is so i'm going to press this little hand here and i'm going to find the darkest patch in the image which i guess is about there put that little eyedropper on it hold down the left mouse button and just make it that little bit darker not much just a small tweak and just come up here to the brightest patch and we'll just go the other way again so 
this is called an S curve. So we've got now a very gentle S curve. Don't do too much, otherwise it just blows everything out. So we've made the brighter bits a bit brighter and the darker bits a bit darker. So let's OK that. And if I compare the two, you can just see there that's made the contrast pop that little bit more. And then do a gentle unsharp mask. So let's rename that there. Just so I remember which one doing. So that was exposure and curves. So we'll duplicate the layer again. We're going to do overlay, filter, other, high pass. And I generally do this really lightly. It's boosted the noise though, so what we need to do then is rename that layer. filter. So I'm going to make everything appear as one layer, make that the new data. So that's control shift alt E. And we're going to rename this as the gentle denoise. Filter, filter noise, reduce noise. And I generally, this is my default setting, strength of seven, Preserve details at 70%. So you can play around with all this. And that just smooths out that peppery detail in the background. So if I unclick that, you can see there, it's just got rid of and smoothed out the background. So let's remove all these details, all these screens right there. That was our first image. And that's our process image. So that's just bring, brought out all that fine detail. What I would then do is go image And there, canvas size, click up here, I've got white selected, I've made it relative, and I make the height 250, and that adds a little bit of white text underneath, and I can then add in my details of the image. So if we go all the way back to Windows, and we find our captures, and it was the 0017. So if you come in here, every time you make a capture in Fire Capture, it records all the settings. So it knows the camera type, what filter, what planet you were looking at, what the diameter of the planet is, magnitude minus 2.9 to near magnitude minus 3. And I like capturing this. So it records the central meridian. So I'm going to go to the text, drag a text box down there. And the good thing is because we recorded the date and the time up here, it's still appearing in the file name. So that was 18th of September, 2022. And the time of the capture or the midpoint of the capture was 0017 universal time. What I'll do, I'll paste in the Central Meridian Times. So when we send these images off to the British Astronomical Association or other professional bodies, they'll incorporate these observations, put them all together, but they need to know what the Central Meridian Time was. And because they have this common timestamp on it, they can now put these all together. Uh, and I recorded that with a Celestron C11. We're at F20, it's an ASI 224MC camera, I had an IR filter, and I used the atmospheric dispersion corrector to avoid any blue red fringing. Oh, I'm looking at that actually. We can't see any blue and red fringing, so I must have had it at the right setting. And I put my name at the bottom. And I'll put the refreshing views in. A bit of free marketing when it gets published. There we go, just unbolt that. So that is an image captured with my telescope in the garden through not the best seeing in the world, but not bad seeing. And this is now ready to be sent to the British Astronomical Association. And they will incorporate this observation with observations from all over the world 
So that now has all the details. It has the Jupiter and Io. It has the date. It has the time in universal time. It has the central meridian times. It has the equipment. It has my name. And that is rather pleasing. And that is recorded with an amateur telescope in a garden in southern England. And we are resolving features in the belts and zones on Jupiter. I always enjoy watching Jupiter. It's such a pleasure to see those storm clouds and see those dynamic features. You know, with an amateur telescope in a garden observatory. And I find it incredible that if you look at the first frame, the sharpest frame, the stacked frames, and then the processed final image, just to see that quality improvement. So it's all there, it's all there in the data, and it's just bringing, using the software to bring that all out. As before then, don't forget to chuck us a like or a subscribe if you've enjoyed the video. We don't charge for this, there's no Patreon funding, we're not trying to sell merchandise. It's just that YouTube will then use that to recommend this video to more fellow observers around the world. Right, I'm going to go and get ready for the uh, Mars occultation tomorrow morning about 5 in the morning. We're going to go and see the Moon pass over the surface of Mars. So I'm going to end with the video footage of that and I will see you in the next video. Thanks for watching. Oh, for fuck's sake. We'll just keep the sharp ones. We're then going to... Blah, 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 blah. And the principle is, sorry, yeah, 50 minutes. So that's around 50 minutes to record all those files thereabouts. 45 plus 35, 70, 80 minutes.